Hi everyone, it's Gayani with Inventive Mind. Thank you for joining me on this channel. Today I have a special guest, Rafael Hurtado, and he is one of my friends who's also an employment law attorney. As you know, I do intellectual property and business law. So part of this is um, my interview series to bring on people who uh, do different things and practices very different areas of law and answer some questions. Um, the his end of March 2020. So as you all know, um, if you we are in California, so uh, our government is shut down. It's in um, well, not the government haven't shut down, but the, we are asked to stay in home uh, lockdown mode. So there's a lot of layoffs because of a lot of closed businesses. So I thought having Raphael here would be a great resource to uh, kind of get some information. But keep in mind that he is uh, for informational purposes only. Um, this is not legal advice. It's not meant to be legal advice. And if you have a specific question, please connect with the employment law attorney in your area. And I will also put the information below this video, how to connect with Ralph and his firm and what that information, where you could find that information. Okay, with that, I will ask Ralph to introduce himself, what he does, what kind of, what does that mean to practice in employment law? And if there's other different type of employment law attorneys out there. Um, so, Ralph, go ahead. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm very happy that we get to have this opportunity to do this virtual meeting, even in this thank time you. of isolation. I know. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so we uh, have an employment law firm here in San Diego, um, and we represent employees throughout the state of California. And our law firm is called Abogato LLP, and it's comprised of my law partner, Rodrigo Guevara, uh, our paralegal, Brenda VRL, and myself. Um, all three of us speak Spanish, so we have the opportunity to cater to a large uh, population of Spanish speakers here in San Diego and in California in general. Um, we also do represent um, English speakers and, and other language speakers as well. Um, but we, we have the added benefit of, of speaking Spanish. So that's been very helpful to, to us and to our clients. Um, we represent employees only and we uh, generally, generally represent employees in either discrimination cases um, or wage and hour cases. And, on the discrimination side, that generally means if an employee is uh, fired or retaliated against for being in what we call a protected class. Uh, so that may mean if an employee is fired for being uh, pregnant or for being disabled, either physically or mentally, um, for uh, being older than 40 years old, um, or for their race, ethnicity, et cetera. Um, on the wage and hour side, uh, we represent employees who maybe were not paid their correct overtime pay or minimum wage, or who were not allowed uh, to take meal and rest breaks as provided by law um, and, and other issues in, in that area as well. So I know that now you've been practicing for about seven years, correct, uh, in California? Um, yeah, well, a little over six years. Um, this last December was my, uh, my, my sixth year mark. Ah, in the seventh year. Yes. And so are you, um, how did you get involved with the employment law area versus there's so many different other areas? So what inspired you to go into this field? Yeah, um, it's a little bit of an interesting story. Um, I actually was fired when I was uh, younger um, for a very silly, silly reason. Um, but during that time, I felt that I didn't really know what the procedure was or, or what the um, or what I could or couldn't do, or who I could talk to or mm -hmm. couldn't talk to. It just felt very powerless. Um, I didn't like that feeling. Um, that um, was one of the catalysts for me to go to law school. Um, I, once I was in law school, I realized that I really wanted to find a way to help uh, Spanish speakers. And so I began exploring that um, through various areas, um, including legal aid, um, and other civil law firms and other volunteer opportunities. And um, my law partner, Rodrigo, shared a similar interest and value. And um, I came along to help him uh, with the previous iteration of Abogato, which eventually led 
to us opening up uh, an employment law firm um, called Abogato LLP. And you've been now uh, open for a couple of years, over a couple of years, correct? Yeah, for a little over three and a half years. We opened wow. in July 2016. Wow. Oh, yeah. I was thinking 2018 for some reason. Wow. Time flies. Um, so with that, I did ask Ralph to kind of go give us, because there's so much information coming out right now, uh, we could probably have like a two hour meeting here <laughs> if we want to. So I did ask him to narrow it down to like five things that we should know. Um, in this time and what applies and he kind of gonna go into those details so um, and Once I know it's some of this is gonna go really fast So I will just let you know that he is writing a blog post on this and I will put the link for that below as well so Ralph, do you want to talk about the five things first and then give us a little more information on each one of them? Yeah, so first of all, thank you again. Um, this uh, motivated me to write a blog post about uh, some of the important issues that are coming up um, very rapidly um, through uh, executive orders and changes in the law. Um, so the five uh, things employees need to know in this age of COVID-19 that I identified are first that California and federal wage and hour laws still apply even if you're working from home. Um, number two, working at the workplace is only allowed for workers in essential critical infrastructure sectors who cannot work from home. Um, three, large employers uh, are required to give notice of a mass layoff with as much notice as is practicable, and we can talk about what that means. Um, number four, California and federal employment discrimination laws still apply uh, during this time of mass layoffs and terminations. And Lastly, number five, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act uh, was just passed by Congress and signed into law by the president, um, which expands FMLA coverage and paid sick leave, and that's set to go uh, into effect on April 2nd, 2020. What is FMLA stands for, by the way? Yes, yeah, uh, we tend to use a lot of uh, abbreviations, so <laughs> for the clarification. FMLA stands for Family Medical Feedback. Okay. And um, other thing I wanted to ask is, um, is um, employment law always state specific? Or is it more, um, you know, is it federal? And obviously there's some federal aspect, but yeah, how does it work? <laughs> yes, another good question. Um, there, so both the federal law and California law have uh, laws on discrimination and wage and hour issues. Um, in California, we, we, uh, focus a lot on state law uh, because thankfully, um, well, at least I, I think thankfully, um, uh, the laws protect employees more than, in many ways more than the federal law. Uh, so our state laws are, are more powerful, if, if you can say that, um, than federal laws. Um, so that's why we focus a lot on California law. In other states, it's a little bit different. Um, they, they focus on federal law more and perhaps they adopt those policies into their own state laws. Now you said yeah, for your number one reason about California and federal law wage hourly laws is still apply if you work from home. Can you go a little more details into that? Yeah. I know it's rapid changing right now, so. <laughs> yeah, well, that's one of the areas that perhaps isn't changing uh, at all, really. Um, okay. Even if you're, uh, what's changing is that a lot, the majority of us are working from home now, right? But mm -hmm. even when we're working from home, um, these wage and hour laws still apply. So one of them, for example, is overtime pay. Um, generally, uh, non-exempt employees um, are entitled to overtime pay if they work more than the maximum hours of work. And for many of us, that means if, if you work more than eight hours in a day, or you work more than 40 hours in a work week, you're entitled to uh, overtime pay, either time and a half or double time, depending on the number of hours that you work. Um, another one of, of uh, the benefits that employees still have, even when working from home, are meal and rest break rights. So if you work for um, five hours, then you should be entitled to a 30 minute uninterrupted meal break. Or if you work for four hours or major fraction thereof, 
um, you're entitled to a 10 minute uninterrupted rest break, even when you're working from home. And lastly, one thing that um, is really important to know is that when we're all working at home, uh, many of us are using our personal home internet, our personal computers, personal cell phones, um, and employers are required to reimburse employees for any personal expense that they incur uh, when they're uh, doing work for their employer. So uh, their employer may have to reimburse them for the use of their personal internet and personal cell phone, et cetera. So um, is, do you think that kind of um, applies to any type of employer? So is it just like certain number limitations there, like small employers versus large corporations? So is that a more of a, you know, that sounds like a loaded question, isn't it? I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, with wage and hour laws, it's not, it's not so much about the size of the employer. There are nuances um, come into play, like, the minimum wage uh, amount changes um, sometimes regarding, uh, or sorry, so, sometimes changes depending on the city or county that you're in. Um, but in general, no. The, in general, these are are the same for all employers, regardless of the size. Um, but 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 those specific questions are questions that you can talk to a lawyer about. Um, the, the one major exception is for exempt employees, and those are employees that meet. A certain requirements. Uh, generally, that means that they're paid a salary that's double the minimum wage um, or more than that, and they meet an exemption. Um, for example, a professional services exemption, uh, like lawyers or dentists or uh, accountants. Mm -hmm. Okay, and as far as the second reason you talked about the essential, essential critical infrastructure sectors, uh, can you go a little bit more into that about COVID-19 and what is allowed right now? Yeah, so this is one area that is completely new to all of us um, as we are all being asked to stay at home. Um, Governor Newsom is issued Executive Order N3320, which requires uh, most workers to stay at home except those that are in essential critical infrastructure sectors. And um, I'll, I'll put a, a full list of what those are in, in the blog, um, and I'll put a link to the state's list of those um, uh, critical infrastructure sectors. But those include, you know, food and agriculture, which is why we're still seeing our grocery store workers working, um, weight, water and wastewater workers, um, transportation and logistic workers, um, communications and information technology workers, which is why we get to have meetings like this. Uh, yeah virtual meetings, um, financial services, so like banks and stuff like that, um, defense workers and, and other, other workers in that area. But even workers in, in those sectors, it is recommended that if they can work from home and they're still able to perform their duties, um, that, they, that they do work from home. Uh, that's, th those are considerations that I think every employer is, is taking at this, at this mm -hmm. moment. Um, and if workers do have to go into the workplace, um, then they should uh, still practice social distancing and also increase um, sanitation procedures. Now, let me ask you something. If somebody is feeling uncomfortable about going into work right now because of all the COVID-19 stuff, like even if you're in an essential field, like let's say a grocery store worker or somebody, if they quit, can they still claim, um, get some unemployment benefits or no? Um, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure. I don't usually handle unemployment claims. Um, okay. But generally, and this is something that employee or, or person would have to look up, it's my understanding that you can't get unemployment if you if you quit, but that don't quote me on that part. Um, I would <laughs> encourage them to go to the unemployment Take a look at to the ED, I'm sorry, uh, to and, and ask for their help. Okay, and then you were talking about layoffs and the notice that a corporations, large corporations, have to give. Um, do you want to elaborate a little bit more on that? Because given that this is a pandemic, I think like a lot of things are you know, at a, not the regular type of notice, right? So. Yeah, so in general, uh, there exists the California and Federal Work, Worker Adjustment Retraining Notification Acts, or the mm -hmm. WARN Acts. Um, 
And those generally require employers to give notice when there's going to be a mass layoff. It doesn't require it of all employers and, or all layoffs. There are, there are requirements that need to be met. Um, but in California, um, generally that meant that employers are supposed to give a 60 day notice to their employees um, prior to a mass layoff. And that usually applies to employers with 75 employees or more. Um, and only to certain employees. Um, but now the, the governor, Governor Newsom, issued another executive order, um, N3120, which suspends the California Warren Act um, with some conditions. And some of those conditions are that the employer is actually still required to give notice um, of the mass layoff as is practicable to do so. And we don't really know what that means exactly, um, other than I think Basically, to me, it means uh, as soon as the employer is able to, you know, yeah. if it's a week before, a few days before, or even a day before, you know, as soon as they can, uh, they still must give notice to employees. And that applies again to employers that have 75 employees or more during the last 12 months. And the, the workers that should receive these notices are workers who are part of a group of 50 employees or more that are laid off during a 30 day rolling period and who have worked at least six out of the 12 months prior to the layoff. Um, the notice itself must include in part a brief statement of why reducing uh, the 60 day notice was required and the sta a statement um, notifying the employees that they are, or they may be, sorry, uh, eligible for unemployment insurance with a direct link uh, to uh, the EDD's uh, website. website. Thank you. And so as far as the, um, you mentioned that the discrimination laws are still in place, um, especially with, um, those are with the protective class of, in, you know, protected classes. So I was wondering, um, in this kind of situation where we have, let's say we have our early worker who is, uh, you know, 65 years old or something and, the um, the company decides to lay them off because um, you know of the COVID nineteen also like won against you know certain high risk people. Is there is that a how do you see that play off or is that something the judge had to decide at this point? Yeah, that that is a very um, sticky situation right <laughs> now. Um, only because you're right, uh, older workers, six, those that are sixty five and older, as far as I know are at higher risk um, of, of being, um, of having complications if they do mm -hmm. uh, contract COVID-19, right? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, there does exist the Federal Employment and Housing Act um, and also uh, federal discrimination, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, the Fair Employment and Housing Act and also federal discrimination <laughs> um, that protect workers and one of the protected classes um, is age. Mm -hmm. um, so employers have to be careful about that. And employees must be mindful that they have rights not to be discriminated against because of their age. Um, that is one of the protected classes. So they can't be terminated or laid off based on that reason. However, because of the, the COVID-19 um, issues, I think that's one of the issues that's important to talk to a lawyer about if you are an employee in that age range to, to consider the specificities of the facts and, and see um, what, can, what can happen um, in your specific case. But in, in going along with the, the fourth point of, you know, California and federal employment discrimination laws still applying, um, in general, employers still cannot use um, COVID-19 as an excuse to terminate or lay off employees uh, for being in one of those protected classes. So for example, because of their age, like we just talked about, uh, their citizenship status is another big one, um, or their race or ethnicity or national origin. Um, unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of issues uh, surrounding that, especially yeah. people from Asia. Um, uh, their color, their marital status, their gender, their sexual orientation, um, those are all protected examples of protected classes, and we'll provide more on the on the blog. Now, Ken, uh, this is just kind of a question that just came to me. 
can somebody um, employer potentially ask you to work because they know that you don't have any children and you're single versus somebody who have kids and single would that be kind of a discrimination would you think in that kind of situation uh, yeah that, that might be um, because of either your marital status um, or, or some other protected um, uh, class issue uh, but again that's an, another issue where we have you to talk to it Tony <laughs> but but it might be <laughs> yeah um, yeah I, I just uh, you know I was just thinking about that and then um, number five you talked about this the newest one the family first coronavirus response respond act and I'm just wondering if you um, wanted to go into that. I know there's a lot of information and it just came. So whatever you could highlight that you have gotten so far. <laughs> yeah. Well, like I said, the, the federal government passed uh, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act or FFCRA um, is the abbreviation. And in general, the FFCRA expands the Family and Medical Leave Act um, and provides for paid sick leave uh, due to COVID-19 related issues. Um, and the FFCRA is scheduled to go into effect in, on April 2nd, 2020, and it will be effective through December 31st, 2020, so for the rest of the year. Oh, wow. Yeah. And um, generally, uh, with the first part, the expanded FMLA or expanded Family uh, Medical Leave Act uh, provides an additional 10 weeks of paid family and medical leave, and it generally applies to workers who... Um, work for an employee that has less than 500 employees. Um, and for those employees that are taking care of a child whose school has been closed or who cannot get childcare because the childcare provider is unavailable due to COVID-19 reasons. Um, one important uh, note about the expanded FMLA is that the first 10 days, uh, they don't have to be paid. Um, and so because of that, the employee has the opportunity to use either vacation time or PTO, paid time off, um, or other uh, uh, paid leave that they have available to them during those first 10 days. Um, then after that, the employer must uh, pay full-time employees at least two-thirds of their regular rate of pay, and part-time employees should be paid at the regular rate of pay for the number of hours that they would normally work. Um, also, employers who have uh, 25 or more employees have to provide uh, protection, job protection for their employees that are on EFMLA or expanded okay. FMLA. Uh, but smaller employees that have less than 25 employees, unfortunately, do not are not going to be required to provide that same protection. Um, and then the second component of the FFCRA was the paid sick leave. Um, and that provides up to 80 hours of paid sick leave uh, for employees that work for employers that have 500 employees or less. Um, and, the, and they can use that paid sick leave for uh, COVID-19 related reasons. And those uh, six reasons are if the employee is under a government quarantine or isolation order due to COVID-19, uh, the employee has been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine uh, because of COVID-19. Um, the employee is experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 and seeking a medical diagnosis um, they, or the employee is caring for an individual who is under a government ordered self-quarantine or a health care provider's recommended self-quarantine because of COVID-19. Um, also, because the employee is taking care of a child whose uh, school is closed or child care is not available because of COVID-19. And lastly, this last point is a little confusing. Um, if the employee is experiencing any other substantially similar conditions specified by the Secretary of Health and Human Services in consultation okay. with the Secretaries of Labor and Treasury. I don't really know what that means right now. Uh, <laughs> we'll figure that out. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people wondering what this means right yeah. now. <laughs> uh, and with that, with the paid sick leave, um, employees should be paid at the regular rate of pay um, uh -huh. if they're carrying... Uh, for their for themselves or if they're caring for another individual then they they are entitled to pay at two-thirds of their regular rate of pay um, and another important thing to know is that um, the FFCRA should not impact any other accrued uh, or legally mandated paid or unpaid leave that employees have 
Um, and they are required, employees are required to, I'm sorry, are allowed to use FFCRA uh, before being required to take any other form of leave, including personal time off that they've accrued. Oh, okay. Um, and lastly, the employers can't change their policies to reduce the amount of leave that an employee is, is entitled to take. So they can't, they can't take advantage of, of employees in that sense. Um, do you know if somebody who is, again, at a higher risk can take a sick leave because they are worried they are at a higher risk? That um, is also a good question that might bring the Fair Employment and Housing Act um, into play. Um, in general, uh, when it comes to disability discrimination, um, employees have the right to seek reasonable accommodations if they have a physical or mental disability. So one of uh -huh. those could be being at high risk if you have some sort of uh, respiratory uh, condition. No, you could be, you know, uh, immunocompromised. Yeah, so you might then be able to request a, a reasonable accommodation. Um, and that's a very uh, in individual specific uh, mm -hmm. fact consideration um, for an employee and, and, uh, and their attorney to, to analyze and see if that applies to them. Now, um, thank you so much. That's a lot of information. I'm so glad that you said you decided to put together a blog post for this because I think, um, you know, you're going to have people going to go there and check that out because I think that's, you know, a lot of information. So um, thank you. And the other question I was going to ask with you, uh, people who are wondering about, um, you know, attorneys, uh, employment attorneys like you, I know there's a lot of different type of payment um, plans people have how does your firm work is it contingency or do they do you do payment plans yeah we um, usually work on a contingency fee basis um, our normal process is that when a potential client calls into the office they'll speak to our paralegal um, mm -hmm. Brenda and she'll take uh, down uh, some notes uh, you know regarding the individual's situation and then Either Rodrigo or myself will review uh, those notes and then we'll call the employee back uh, with any questions that we may have um, and, and uh, give them our thoughts if, if we're able to. Um, if we aren't able to help them, then we usually refer them to the lawyer referral service number or to another employment lawyer. Or if we identify that it's a completely different issue, uh, like a workers' compensation issue or a business law issue, then we try to refer them to any of our contacts that uh, that we have in our networks. Um, if we are potentially able to help them and we want to learn more, in normal times we would invite them over to the office uh, <laughs> so that we may review any documents or speak to them in person. Um, I think nowadays we we will have to figure some sort of virtual meeting or an extended phone call um, to make that happen. Then after that, um, you know, we'll we'll analyze the situation and, and consider whether we can take uh, that individual's case or, or not. Thank you. And the other thing I was just curious about is your law firm name. Yes. It's, what does it mean? And if you could share it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so Avogato is, uh, is just a name that my law partner, Rodrigo, came up with. Um, I defer to him as to exactly how he came up to it with it okay. i mean uh but i know that it is uh it's a little bit of a play on words um we, we both wanted to have a name for our firm that wasn't just our last names um uh -huh. because we wanted it to be more expensive um and um abogado is a is a attorney in spanish so that would be with a d um oh. ours has a has a t um and the last part of it is gato it means cat and we have a lion as a as our little I saw that. logo yeah. or mascot, so um, that's that's part of the reason. Yeah, that's super cool. Um, so, and I I would like to end the interview by asking because we are all in shelter in place, just like you. Um, so, what do you do, Ralph, to keep sane right now? What kind of you know? What do you practice to kind of stay centered? Yeah, um, well, a few things. Um, for me specifically, uh, the, the biggest thing is, is my uh, Christian faith. Um, 
uh, I do lean on that a lot. Um, okay. our, our church uh, is still having a lot of online uh, meetings and, and, and socials. Um, we're having a, a little gathering with our friends from church a little later. Um, so that's been amazing for, for Rob and I. Rob is my uh, life partner. And uh, another thing is um, uh, for me, being outside and physical exercise has been very important. Um, it's getting, it's starting to get a little harder now that parks are closing. Um, so I'm a little yeah. bit afraid that we'll lose that, that um, opportunity that we have right now. But I continue to ride my bike as much as I can, um, exercise and do yoga um, and other forms of exercise in the house um, as much as I can. And did you say you have a dog? <laughs> yes, and he's actually right next to me. Um, <laughs> do we, be a part of this. Do we um, get to see him? <laughs> sure, let's see. Would he be part of the interview? <laughs> oh, look at this. <laughs> I think he's like, I'm ready to go for a walk. <laughs> so, uh, he's another, another thing that helps keep us sane. And, um, and we just like, around. his name is Diego. Diego. Oh, well, I'm glad Diego joined and he was very quiet, even though he was being next to you. Yes, so. I'm glad. No, cats or squirrels are outside or else you don't have <laughs> Those are the wonders of working from home and having virtual meetings that we all have. Exactly. Today. Exactly. Um, so thank you, Ralph. Um, so again, for those who are watching, thank you for joining us. And I will put Ralph's information below this video and information to his um, website for his firm and his Facebook page for the firm. And so you could find the blog article that we've been mentioning throughout this. So, um, and thank you so much for joining Ralph and doing this interview. Thank I will you. um signing off right now and thanks everybody and see you next time. Bye.